So welcome. I'm glad to see everyone this morning. Some familiar faces, some new faces. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Sharice Flynn. Uh, why, why am I here? Why am I doing this class? Um, I feel very grateful that I've had a lot of experience and been able to learn some of these things the hard way. Um, also been able to learn through my clients. So what I'm going to be sharing today is um, direct experience. I was the COO of Douala for over six years and during my time there we raised around 32 million in venture capital. Um, both from local investors, strategic investors, coastal investors, Andreessen Horowitz, which is a well-known investor, was one of our investors. Um, had the opportunity to move to San Francisco and um, grow our team um, for Duala in San Francisco. So have kind of that West Coast experience. Uh, then more locally, the last two and a half years, I've helped around you know, just about a half a dozen companies raise over $20 million in venture capital. Um, you can tell that number that uh, most of those rounds have been um, early stage um, in the you know, 500K to 1.5 million. Um, one of my clients just closed an $8 million round. Um, so that's kind of the, the variance of what I've seen uh, both locally and in the Midwest. Um, and we'll be bringing that experience to this class today. Uh, this is somewhat hard for me to just stand up in front um, the entire day. So I'm going to try to make it as interactive as possible. Um, but like Mike said, this is we're trying to pack in a lot of information, trying to give you an overview of all the things that happen along the fundraising journey, um, so that at least you're starting to think about them um, ahead of time, um, or if not, you'll experience them when you're in the journey. Um, that was my experience. Uh, some of these things came up, and I was like, wow, I wish someone would have told me about that ahead of time. So those are the things we're, we're, we're going to try to share. Uh, I'm, again, very interactive, so if you have a question, pop up your hand. If it gets out of control, I'll let you know, but um, <laughs> more questions are welcome. So when I tried to think about how do I put a framework around <coughs> fundraising, um, what came to mind was three key areas, momentum, materials, and meeting. So if you're, if you're summarizing, you know, how do I think about fundraising process. I think the first most important key is momentum in your business. And that can mean a lot of different things depending on are you at the idea stage, do you have customers, uh, do you have any PR, do people know about you, momentum as far as brand awareness goes. Uh, then momentum has to carry through that entire process as you start to talk to investors. You want to build upon the momentum of talking to a bunch of investors, um, the momentum of follow-up, the momentum of pushing and driving that towards a close. So momentum is, I think, a very key word uh, when you are fundraising. Another key component of fundraising are all the materials that are necessary. Um, we'll be spending quite a bit of time on pitch decks today, uh, and I know um, several of the companies from the GIA, I know you guys have spent time on pitch decks, so I'm going to try to uh, make it a little interactive for you and um, hopefully it won't be completely dry for, for those that already have a basis of their pitch track. Um, we're also going to be spending time on financial models. Um, you know, I've worked with clients where they're like, yeah, I don't need a financial model. I'm just going to go pitch and have conversations with investors. And I've kind of said, okay, if you, if you think that that's going to work, um, good luck. But at some point, at some point in the process, they're going to ask you for a financial model. Um, I've never seen a deal close without an investor wanting to see a financial model, so um, I'll just share that wisdom. Uh, due diligence. Um, again, different types of investors go very deep in due diligence. Others are kind of a little more lax, but we're going to try to prepare you for if someone goes deep in diligence, what are the things that they're going to expect um, that you have ready? Some of the other materials that we're going to go into, um, term sheets, uh, uh, closing documents, negotiations. So those are kind of all the materials uh, that you need to be prepared. There's other little things, but I think that that pretty much covers it. Like if you have those things ready, I think you'll be in a good spot to fundraise. And then meetings. Um, we're not going to be getting in a lot of the psychology and um, maybe the logistics of meetings, but meetings are a really important thing and how you manage those meetings with investors and those follow-up meetings uh, is an important part of the fundraising process. And this is often what the fundraising process looks like. Um, as a very linear person, I would love if it was this. You know, just straight and narrow. You do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. Um, 
my experience and the experience I've had for my clients is it often ends up like this. So you're going one, one half, sometimes you kind of come back here, you might get all the way to here, and all of a sudden <coughs> things get messy up in here. Uh, and I just kind of like to give people that image of fundraising is a process, and I think you'll be more successful if you run it as a process, um, but be prepared for the twists and the turns and the things you can't anticipate. Um, and maybe just prepare your mindset of it's not going to probably be as linear as what we had all hoped. Um, <clears throat> as you think about kind of the checklist, if you are kind of a linear person that wants to do kind of A and then B and then C, I tried to break it down into what would be some of the order um, in order to prepare uh, for that, that fundraising. So really starting with momentum. Um, I think it's virtually impossible to raise capital unless you have some sort of momentum. Again, thinking about the stage of your business, what does momentum mean for you? Um, Jake, I'm going to call on you. Uh, what would momentum at this stage of the company mean for you? Uh, it would mean securing um, supplier partnerships and also uh, distribution deals. So you have to have partnerships in order to really be in a good spot to raise. Todd, are you actively thinking about raising? <laughs> what would momentum look like for you? Um, attention and social media. Can you go a little bit further? Like brand awareness? Uh, yeah, so maybe tw Twitter followers, um, registrations within the platform, those sorts of things. Okay. Trevor, what would momentum look like for you? Um, supplier, like uh, manufacturing contracts. So life insurers agreeing to write our product. So you have to have some kind of basic product and uh, relationships established in order for the product to get off the ground. Yeah. yeah. Um, so depending if you're a little bit later stage, uh, momentum will be like how many, a lot of uh, investors will look at how many customers do you have and are those customers growing. Uh, investor relationships. This is really key and really early on in the process. Uh, I've just seen this mistake over and over and over where people are like, okay, I'm now ready to raise. Who am I going to talk to? They haven't kind of done the work to start to build the relationships with investors. They haven't done the work to have any brand awareness. They haven't done the work um, to start making those contacts. Because it takes time. You know, you're ready to go. And someone might not respond to your, your email for two weeks. Um, they might be on vacation. They might be closing another deal. Uh, all of it takes a lot of time. And so be thinking about who are the people that you would want to be fundraising from? Um, how are you going to be making those um, connections, those relationships ahead of time before you're just like ready to go raise? I think it also plays into the next part of the process, which is um, starting to validate your strategy. There's a bunch of different ways for you to raise capital. You can raise capital from friends and family. You can raise capital from wealthy individuals. You can raise capital through um, angels. Um, I have to say that true angel networks are kind of um, on the decline. Uh, we have some statistics on that, that uh, there's not as many angel investments anymore. You're seeing those more either um, wealthy individuals or VC funds that have more of an early stage um, fund. Um, there's early stage um, VCs to get in front of, and there's strategic investors. And it's, it's helpful if you start to talk to individuals, see what their appetite is, um, what their interest is in companies like you. Um, do they make early stage investments? Um, starting to do that diligence sooner than later is helpful. Uh, the next part of the process is um, developing your pitch and starting to practice your pitch. I think practice is really important. Um, not practicing on an investor the first time you've given it uh, is probably a, a really helpful idea. Um, building out your financial model, uh, also something that's really important to do uh, prior to starting to pitch, because if someone's really interested, they might want that financial model the next week. Um, organizing your due diligence is another part of the process. This is also something I always um, encourage people to do ahead of time. And don't wait for an investor to give you a due diligence list. Um, start to have a Dropbox of all your diligence pulled, pulled together ahead of time. We're going to be going into more detail in a lot of these areas. Um, 
And then once you get to the investor meetings, um, there's introductory coffee, there's formal pitches, there's follow-up calls. To, um, sometimes you have to come in and, and pitch the partner groups. Um, this whole section could have like seven or eight uh, additional bullet points under it once you get to that stage. Then there's the negotiation, managing the close, and ongoing communications. Does anyone have any questions so far around, kind of from my viewpoint, how I see the fundraising process? So two, mm -hmm. and if these are more appropriate, if you want to defer them, that's fine. One is, um, actually they're both on the investor strategy. Uh, do you, have you found, is it necessary to raise friends and family before you can approach, you know, other strangers basically? Uh, and uh, the, I don't know if this is related or not, but you mentioned that angel groups are on the decline. I was wondering if you could uh, provide a little more color on, on why that might be. Yeah, um, I think that we might as well just hit those right now. Um, so the investor strategy, I would say it's helpful, it's not mandatory. Um, what it signals is that people that know you and trust you are willing to put money behind your idea. Um, so I think it's validating, especially for investors that don't know you, right? Um, they are like, okay, well this, this lady or woman or this lady or male was able to get get people that he knows or she knows to put money behind them um, I think that that's what it serves is kind of the validation of you as an entrepreneur um, but I've never said and seen an investor say oh without any you know friends and family I won't do it but it's helpful uh, then when it comes to why um, angel funding is on decline uh, I believe in the appendix I actually put an article um, in there that talks about it in depth but kind of the general thesis is um, as funds have gotten larger they're just doing larger deals and even the like the series a or the seed round are becoming much larger than what they what you were seeing as angel funding so it's somewhat of it just being swept upstream um, what I find in the Midwest and you could almost say non-coastal regions, I think angel funding is still pretty predominant, but as you look at statistically across the entire nation, because those large funds are, are doing larger seed round investments, it's not really falling in the angel category anymore. So you might also just think, what region would I be raising from and what's normal? Trevor? Just think, like, in terms of the friends and family round, um, would you also see it as the amount of money you need? So I'm thinking, you know, if, um, you're, you're like you manufacture in something hardware, and you need four billion dollars. They might be like, okay, fair enough. You shouldn't have friends and family. But if you need a hundred k, it's like, why are you coming to us? Can you not find, you know, hundred k? Yes, that account? that will definitely fall into the strategy as well. Okay. And a lot of seed stage investors are just not interested in anything less than five hundred k to a million. Right. And if you only need a hundred k to get to the next milestone without a lot of dilution and to prove things out, it's like why would you over raise if you weren't, if you kind of had a very specific set of milestones in front of you that required less capital. Right. Okay, um, this is kind of beating the point on <coughs> over the head. Um, this is just a zoom in once you pitch to get to a term sheet, what you can expect. There's many, many pages um, within just pitching to term sheet to close. Um, I'm not going to go into all the nuances here, but I tried to just overlay it. Um, again, these are from client experiences where they're like, pitching is going really great. And then two months later, they still haven't closed uh, because the negotiations took a lot of time. The diligence took much more time. Um, the partners required them to come back in, you know, and their partner meeting wasn't for two and a half weeks later. So, I mean, it just creates these gaps in the timeline of you think you're almost there and all of it just continues to, to take more time. So be prepared for that. And I think that why, why Mike and I like to really um, hone in on this is most of your businesses are very capital um, sensitive. So if you think you're gonna close and you're almost out of cash and it takes another three months, what's gonna happen to your business? So just be thinking about um, anticipating um, that it might take more time and what you're going to do from a cash standpoint uh, during that very critical point of your business. All right. Um, there is a separate handout um, called the Slide Deck Workbook that we're going to be actively working through. Uh, but I, before we get into the pitch deck, I think it's just really important. If your idea and execution are lacking, 
it doesn't really matter how good your pitch is. Um, you can be a great storyteller, but if the underlying business, if the underlying idea, and if you don't have execution isn't there, you're going to have a really hard time raising capital. Some of the typical pitch deck slides um, that we have seen in early stage companies um, are these like 15 plus um, slides here. And I just pulled them out and like there's no magic way to pitch, um, but these are the typical slides that you would see in a compelling pitch deck. Um, I'm not going to go through um, all of them here. I would say if you try to do every single one, your deck is going to be too long. So find what makes sense for the way your business is structured, the way that you, you are a storyteller. Ultimately, as an entrepreneur, you're telling the story of your business. So the slides should be in, in kind of a natural way that you would tell the story. Um, but these are you know, several of the different themes and topics that you should pick, pick from um, in order to put together a compelling pitch deck. And again, ha limit your slides at around 11 or 12. Um, that's where the challenge comes in. I've seen people that want 10 slides just on their product or four slides on what their problem is. You're, you're going to lose the attention of an investor, so you really have to think about how to make that short and sweet. Um, Mm -hmm. So how about, you know, and maybe as part of the pitch, 11 or 12, but a, a larger deck uh, with some backup slides in case they want to get that done? Right. Um, so I think that that is um, very appropriate, is to have a whole bunch of appendix slides ready to go. So if someone asks you a question, you could, you could flip to it. Um, what I also encourage people, though, is if you have a really condensed storyline, to stay on track and say, you know, if we have time at the end of that, I'd be happy to go in further detail. Because what can happen is you can go so far in detail that you kind of lose the momentum around what's the whole picture that you're trying to paint. Uh, and that's why it's also helpful to kind of boil it up and keep it high level. Because oftentimes you have, you really have five minutes of the investor's intention to hook them before who knows what they're thinking about, right? But if they're excited, they're going to stay with you and go deeper. Uh, so this next thing is just kind of talking about, you know, what are investors looking for? Obviously, they're looking for a really big market opportunity. Um, often, your 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 strategic investors or VCs are looking for something that has over a billion dollar um, market potential. Um, I've had some people just like look at me like. What do you mean? My little idea is not going to get funded. It's like a $100 million opportunity. That's a great opportunity. And I would say $100 million is a wonderful opportunity if that's the entire market size, but you're probably not going to get the big VC funding. So just kind of know who your, your audience is and what they're looking for. If they can get a billion dollar market opportunity, they're going to go for those companies all day long. Uh, more local strategic um, investors might go for smaller opportunities. So that just kind of narrows, you know, there's different forks in the road as far as who you talk to throughout the fundraising journey. Uh, a great team. You, you don't necessarily have to all um, have um, 50 years or 20 years of experience in the area, but who have you put together um, to, to convince an investor that you're the team to pull this off? Sometimes it's just ambition and hustle that will show an investor that you along with some inventor, uh, investor um, board members and um, advisors, you know what it takes to, to get it done. Um, a strong, strong business model is always really important. How do you plan to charge? Do the fundamentals make sense? Um, do you have a, a big enough vision? Do they believe in your vision? Do you have a strong enough vision? You know, sometimes people start businesses because they see an opportunity and they think they can do it, but they're not very passionate about it. That starts to come through when you're when you're pitching and meeting with investors. So, you know, do you have the passion? Do you have the vision to pull off the business that you're um, working on? And then, is there any competitive mo or secret sauce? Is there anything preventing someone else from going and raising ten million dollars and doing exactly what you've done? So, those are some of the key things that, as investors are meeting with you, that they're looking for. I would say use Google um, when you're trying to put together your pitch deck. Um, I'm a, sometimes a very visual learner, and I, I feel like I'm the artist who likes to take <coughs> stuff and recraft it. 
Um, Google has a lot of amazing um, pitch decks out there. So if you need some ideas of, hey, I don't know the best way to structure my pitch deck. I don't know the best way to tell my story. Go, go look on Google. There's a, a plethora of pitch decks that you might pull some ideas from. Um, some other things that I think are helpful in structuring your, your pitch deck. Um, when you start building your pitch deck, I think it's, it's perfectly okay to say problem, solution, team, like very generic headings. But as you iterate on it, if you're able to take problem and all of a sudden do a headline rather than <coughs> your, say, your slide saying problem, I think it becomes a much more compelling story. That if an investor was only to read your headlines, what could they learn? That's a, a kind of a trick that I've learned over the years of if you just read each single headline, you should be able to kind of walk away knowing what this company does, what they're solving, and why, why you should be excited. I think that this is a great example. Instead of saying team, you could say the right mix of passion and experience. That's much more compelling than saying team. Um, language. Avoid phrases that everyone uses. Like, I'm so sick of seeing disruptive, innovative, world class. What does that mean? Um, and use your voice. Ultimately, you're the one going to be giving this pitch. And if it feels, if it feels like textbook, wonderful pitch deck, but it's not your language, you're going to stumble. It's not going to come across authentically. So think through how you talk, how you tell a story. Should we? Uh -huh. Just out of curiosity, the, you know, cause you, two slides back, you talked about the billion dollar market segment or capacity, I think you call it. But does the pitch deck change much, whether you're going for that scale or whether, let's say, you're in a local level and you're trying to raise capital for a much smaller business, but you still have the same process to go through? Does the, does the deck change much? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say the, the structure can stay the same. Um, just the way that you talk about the opportunity and who you would be raising from would change. So it goes back to strategy, it seems, goes back to and strategy. who you're approaching. Mm -hmm. And then it might change the way that you actually pitch. Um, so if you're not going kind of after um, professional VCs or professional angels, you're going more after kind of the friends and family or um, local investors, they don't always necessarily need a pitch deck. It might be a coffee where you say, hey, I want to go through this idea with you. It might be more conversational, but I think doing the work to put the pitch deck together um, is, is very beneficial because it really makes you can kind of condense your talking points, and it also gives you some material to leave with them after, after you meet with them. Um, I love this little graph. Uh, most people's attention, I don't even think makes it to five minutes. Uh, I think there's a new study out that was like 37 seconds and you can lose someone's attention. So um, you're really excited about your business. You're really engaged. But it doesn't mean necessarily uh, an investor is going to follow with you. And that also means that you might have to be making the same point several times throughout the investor um, pitch. Because even though you made it once, that might have been when he was looking phone his he or she was making her phone right um, I, ha I had to learn this the hard way of over and over we were pitching investors and they would come back with these questions were like like I can't believe they missed that like that was so obvious to me pitching them uh, and then I learned well I only said it once here and maybe I didn't say it as clearly as what I thought and then it was about five minutes into the pitch so maybe they weren't paying attention um, I, I think we all want to believe that everyone's going to just be kind of at the edge of the sea listening to us, but the reality is these investors, um, and just as human beings, we're so wired to multitask that the tension isn't always there. So think about that when you're structuring your pitch deck. If, if they were only to walk away with one or two things, that should be at the beginning of your deck, versus you spending you know the first five minutes talking about you and what your experience is and where you grew up. and. Uh, you know what, that's probably not going to be the thing that sells the investor on investing in you. So save that for maybe later um, in the pitch. Uh, the, so the first five minutes are really the most important to, you know, hooking the interest of the investor. And you can always spend the rest of the meeting deep diving, uh, but this is also where you kind of, what I mentioned, Bernie, is really keeping on point of trying to tell your entire story um, in its totality. 
um, in, in the first five minutes. All right, now we are going to kind of start a working session. Um, for any of you that have already done pitch decks, um, I would normally say like don't have your computer out the entire time, but if you want to pull out your computer, pull up your pitch deck, um, it's totally appropriate to do that because um, we're going to be working each slide in, in depth. So starting with the cover slide, um, this is, uh, I always like that you put your positioning ex positioning statement on your cover slide. This is kind of your tagline, you know, the who, what, how, why. Why do you exist? What is, what is your company there for? And this sets the stage for them. Um, it can just, you know, look at the first slide and already start to get a feel um, for what you're about. So, um, pulling out the workbook, um, let's start to work on what would be your, your positioning statement. Um, can I have a few people um, willing to share their um, statement? Bernie. Sure. Strategic Holdings helps entrepreneurs to achieve their dreams by providing guidance, connections, and funding in a word partnership. Thank you. How does that resonate with everyone else? Thoughts, feedback. I like that it's simple to short. I don't have to like, well, what's the whole thing? What? What is it? What? Yeah. I like that. Other thoughts, feedback? Can you hear it again? Can you hear it? Can you say it one more time? Sure. Sorry. Strategic Holdings helps entrepreneurs to achieve their dreams by providing guidance, connections, and funding in a word partnership. So it's like a one-stop shop for an entrepreneur to you know, take their idea and turn it into an actual business. Yeah. So yeah, it's good. Time. You like, tell me. I mean, <laughs> that's what it sounds like to me. Perfect. Yeah. That's what I'm going for. Yeah. Then yeah, that's good. Um, can I have another person to share? Sorry, your name? Oh, Bob. Bob. 3DP, the future we look at military communication. Short, sweet. Yeah. How do you do it? Can't tell you. Can't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Still trying that's to figure close. it out. Okay, so that's a great point. It's close. Yeah, there's times that you don't exactly know the details, right? And so that, that might be an area of like, it is short and sweet, but as you figure out more, I would um, encourage you to be more specific. Do you want to show yours? Sure. Uh, Prosper, we measure and monitor your body's internal biological clock to help people live stronger, longer lives. Any questions, feedback for Richard? It's a little long. What would you cut? I'd probably just take stronger, longer, and make it one word. Okay. Prosper has a lot of financial connotations. I mean, it doesn't need to, but that made me, as soon as you said prosper, more like financial in my brain. Jake, you want to share yours? Sure. Um, uh, everyday life helps middle income people feel confident they can provide for their families no matter what by providing online insurance concierge service. My initial reaction, it's a little wordy. Yeah. <coughs> Um, it's hard to slice and dice as we're like standing here, um, but I, I would encourage you to think about, can you cut some words out? Sure, yeah. Um, and there's, I would, there's also times where you have kind of multiple forms, an expanded form and a much shorter form. If you think about your, your deck, your, you know, your, um, your, your logo, a date, and this line, like I really feel like it should be not multiple lines, <laughs> but, you know, visually. It should be like the line that gets people interested. The, that this position statement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, we're gonna keep moving. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, the first slide, the problem. So this is the slide that gets into what are you solving? What customer pain point are you alleviating? Why does your company exist? Um, and just kind of a word of caution, avoid looking like a solution looking for a problem. And this sometimes happens, you know, as entrepreneurs, you just get 
stuck on this great, great idea, and the idea and the excitement around it was what, as an entrepreneur, drew you to it. Sometimes you do have to go back and say, why was I excited about that? What is the problem? And that's the challenge. Um, not all companies are started out of a problem, but if you're going to convince an investor, they want to know, what, why should you exist? What's the problem? And it's more than just your excitement, or just more than your idea. So I'm going to give you a round. We're, we're going to just kind of sh try to speed this up. I'm going to give you about three minutes to work on your problem. Move on from the problems um, slide and now get to um, here's an example. Uh, in your book, there was a problem slide. Uh, you know, price hotels, no easy way to exist. Just an example of being very succinct in the way that you talk about your problem. Um, I don't think there's any like magic rule of three, but I've seen this successfully pulled off. If you kind of find three different areas to hone in on, on why, why there's a problem, um, it makes it succinct and an easy way to uh, communicate your, your problem statement. Um, here's one other example. Um, the reason I like this problem statement is they were already able to kind of pull in the size of the opportunity when they're talking about the problem. And when you think back to that, you know, you only have a minute to five minutes to 30 seconds to get an investor's attention. If you can paint the picture in numbers um, early on, I think it can be a very compelling way um, to, to start off your pitch. Now let's move into the solution. So the solution slide explains how you alleviate the pain and the problem. Um, and you might get as specific to say, I'm a web platform, I'm a SaaS software, I'm hardware. Um, let them know, you know more specifically how you're doing it, and then just demonstrate how you make your customer's life better. Uh, this is an example from Airbnb's very early pitch deck. They save money, they make money, and they create a sharing culture. So that's how they were able to very succinctly say, these are the things we solve for. One of the ways that you can also think about it is if, you, if you're breaking your problems statement into kind of three themes, essentially the solution can mirror, you know, if these three problems exist, this is, you know, the solution side of it. They should, you know, go hand in hand. I have a question. Uh -huh. Maybe, um, I mean, I have a lot of solutions, so I'm trying to think of how to hone it. So, which is why I don't, I mean, I can share a bunch of them, but what I'm intrigued with is how do you convey, how do you convey a solution that's very esoteric? That's what I'm, what I'm wrestling with. I can talk about things as broad as long-term value or the house gives you joy, but mm -hmm. when you're talking about energy, when you're talking about um, like a house's ability to provide well-being, a lot of what I hear in this is it's a solution that's very tactile. I save money, um, but a lot of times in people's homes there's an expression of emotion that's, or even something that's even more abstract is, um, well-being. Okay. I'm trying, and I've been trying to figure out how to translate that in a business context. You see where I'm going? Yeah, um, so I think this is where, yeah, I sometimes spend hours with clients on two slides, problem and solution, right? And we talk through it and we look at it from different angles. So just like off the top of my head, it's hard to say, here you go. Sure. <laughs> um, but I would encourage you to think about one, what resonates with you? So if it is joy, like you're creating joy, that's a big statement. But if you can be visionary behind that and get behind, my solution creates joy, I think it's interesting. And as an investor, I'd want to know more, right? I'm like, well, how do you do that? You know, so if you, if, if you want to make those statements, I don't think that, that it, they don't have to be as like linear as maybe a software solution. I don't know if, what kind of product you have. Um, that could be somewhat um, compelling for me to want to learn more. Mm -hmm. So a good example might be that there's a company called Calm, C-A-L-M, and they sell uh, basically calmness. They just raised another $150 million on a billion dollar valuation, and they're the most, one of the most recent unicorns. So don't sell it short, but you might go out and look at what Calm is doing, um, and how they're saying it. 
Mm -hmm. they, actually, they actually produce a ton of revenue, too. Besides the fact that they've got a crazy valuation, they raise a lot of money, they make a lot of money. Uh, they're selling an app on the store that's like 100 bucks a year, 80 bucks a year, 70, 70 bucks a year, and they're selling a lot of them. So in, on the base point, there is a market. You just got to find the language, and they might be a good example. They are saying selling to employers, right? So they have a very good business model. They sell the individuals too. Yeah. But they're not working. 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 they are not working they are not working they are that's a great example. Thanks, Mike. Uh, moving on to product. Um, so when you think about product slides, there's a lot of different ways you can talk about your product. It might be screenshots. It might be actual photos. Um, there's some investors that love demos, and I would say try not to do a live demo. I've just seen it go wrong so many times. So if you want to do video capturing of you doing a demo, that's probably a more effective way than, also it's hard to stay on point. You're like, oh, I'm just gonna log in and do this and do this and do this, and three, four, five minutes later, you've um, kind of killed your pitch doing your demo. So um, screenshots, photos are just really helpful of kind of giving a flavor for what is it that you've created. Um, some investors, are, I call it like product junkies. They they just if they love the product, they'll invest in you, and um, likely that's the investor you would do a deep dive um, after this kind of initial pitch on your product, rather than spending the first um, five minutes going really deep in your product. But think about you know how how do you best represent your product? Um, we're not going to actually workshop this one. You guys can workshop this one on your own. Um, does anyone have any questions, or do they have a product that like I don't know how I would demonstrate it? Well, one, you know, for many of us, probably our products are, or at least the, you know, are still in development. So, uh, what are good ways in, for early stage companies where it's you might, might not have the prettiest screenshots mm. to show? There's a couple ways to go about it. Um, there's, I think, danger in putting something that's not actually in existence on your product page, right? Because then an investor thinks it exists. Um, there's a danger of not having anything. So I would say kind of meet meet you kind of in the middle where, you know, if you don't have anything, then you should probably put together some mock-ups and say, this is a mock-up of how our products, uh, how we think it's going to function. We might be getting user feedback and it's subject to change, but there's something there. Um, can don't you make show it, the beta version? Yeah, I think you can show beta and just be clear where, where yeah. it's at. Um, be careful not to be so apologetic, though. Like, oh, this isn't good enough, da 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 da, da because it takes like um, the momentum out of that side when you're like, oh, it's only beta, it's only this, only that. Yeah. Don't be so apologetic um, with where you're at. Just say, this is where we're at, these are the initial beta screens, we're doing testing, it's likely going to, you know, continue to fall. Yeah. Jen? What it, like, so I have one of the renderings that I done by my architect. Uh -huh. What if for fear of something you're going to take, I mean, is that something where just non-disclosure right out the gates? Uh, so they don't replicate the model that I have already put time and money to build? So there's a lot of um, debate around NDAs and putting yourself out there. Um, my general attitude and a lot of investors' attitude is they won't sign an NDA. Uh, just most strategic investors are just like, I see too many deals, I'm not going to sign an NDA. Uh, and I think this is where trust in yourself and belief that you're the one that's meant to create this comes into play. Um, they might get a rendering, but it's going to take a whole much more than a rendering um, to pull off what you have, right? So you kind of have to believe that um, you have what it's take, going to take to be successful. And if you have the idea, you're probably not the only one that has that idea. I mean, that's just reality, right? <laughs> um, and you know, investors aren't really in the business of ripping off people's ideas. If they are, they're not the investors you want to be talking to. So I would just use your own discretion on that going into it. Bernie? Due diligence goes both ways. Right. Right. That's a good way to state it. What did he say? Due diligence goes both ways. I mean, you have to kind of have trust in who you're sitting in front of. 
uh, integrity in them as well, and both sides. Trevor. Are you guys sugarcoating the language when you say that you know, your general thought is that uh, VCs don't sign NDAs, or like, have you ever seen a VC sign an NDA? I've had strategic investors sign NDAs. Yeah. I've never had a VC sign an NDA, okay. never. And I mean, that was like one of the things I learned early on, like, hey, will you sign this NDA? And they're like, are you, have you ever raised capital? I mean, that was essentially the response I got, was like, we do not sign NDAs. But if it's strategic, they often will. And that, I find that sometimes the strategics will actually lead the way of saying, here's our NDA, because they want to share their problems with you as well, so that there's more collaboration. <coughs> Um, any other questions on product, like how you should develop a site? David? Uh, so you've got this model set up for the product. It's more of this kind of software thing, Airbnb. If you're doing more of a service or a consulting service, what do you put on the slide? Ah, um, it's probably, you might have to use icons um, or photos. I mean, if, you know, like you helping someone, right? If that's, if you're a service-based industry. Um, but that's where you make very clear of like, you're providing a service and there may or may not be actual, like tangible things around it. Any other questions when it comes to product? Okay, um, next slide, <coughs> market size. So I'm breaking the market down by um, total available, serviceable, serviceable and share. Um, this example again is uh, from one of Airbnb's early pitch deck. Um, I really kind of like the way they did it. So, two billion trips are, are booked um, worldwide. That's their total available market. And then 560 million are budget and online. So that's where they said, of all this travel that can occur in the world, we're focused on budget and online. So they slice their market, budget online. That's their serviceable available market. And then, they think if they got 15% of the market, that would be 84 million trips with Airbnb. And what I'll show in the next slide, I think that these go hand in hand. They're, they take their market size, they get to this 84 million, and then they show, okay, so how are, what, what's our revenue opportunity? So when you're thinking about breaking down the market, one of my big pet peeves is like someone who just says, it's a billion dollar market, there's all this money spent in an area. And my question is, but how are you going to make money in that market? Um, your slice of it might be super, super small, and it's just a big number. You, you need to figure out like how it applies to your business. So back to Airbnb, they take those 84 um, million trips, and they say an average of $25 um, fee. That's how they would get to 200 million um, of revenue on 15% of that market share. I know that's a lot to cover super, super fast. Um, what kind of questions exist or, Trevor? Do you like when it's presented um, total market and segmented market and then the amount of market you can get kind of like a top down chart? Or do you, prefer, do you think it should be broken out kind of like this, a little bit more? <clears throat> I think it, um, however it's logical for you to walk through it. Like what's the most logical way for you to say, there's this big opportunity, I'm focused on this, uh, this is how, and if I take a percentage of that, this is how I can make money. Um, that's the way I like it done. Um, I think it, it um, makes the market more palatable than just saying, here's everything. And I'm not, without getting deep into you, your business, um, the question is like, what's unique about that segment? And do you think, are there any, why'd you pick that segment? So when you make that break, you know, saying why, why are you focused on that segment? The, it's like there's two sides to that. Um, sometimes that segment can be too small. So you might end up with a number that's only like 50 million if you capture the entire thing, right? right? So then it's like you've almost undersold yourself if you think you're gonna go after more markets in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so think about the best way. It's kind of like massaging um, what's the best way to show the data, to show the opportunity, but then also show your focus. And there's kind of multiple ways to do that. Any other questions about market size, Jen? Maybe about market size specifically, but like market feasibility studies, like how, 
how long before they're considered out of date? Is it one, two, three years? Um, so that's provided one from 2017, so if I don't have to go pay for another one supported <coughs> what I'm doing. Um, uh, so more confusability. Um, I have some thoughts. Mike, do you have any initial thoughts? Well, the feasibility, the market feasibility is going to be relative to how quick the market changes. So every market changes at a different rate. You know, like the auto industry, it takes four or five years to create parts. So you can't just flip the new model out there and react and go a year. So the probably your feasibility age is not going to kill it. You get into consumer habits in music. Online downloadable music it changes every day. So you almost can't do a feasibility. So I think you have to understand what's the life cycle or the sell cycle uh, in the marketplace? How often do people buy and acquire? Yeah, from my experience, like super, super early on when you're raising capital in a, uh, again, a technology software-based business, I've never had an investor ask, ask me for market feasibility study. It's more, um, how, what's my traction? I mean, that's more what's showing feasibility, especially when you're creating a new product in like technology and software. I think what you're building is different, so the way you think about market feasibility might be different um, than my experience in software. Sorry, on market size, just one thing. I, I, I hear people say, like, in your pitch, don't say, if we could only get 1% of this market or whatever, we'd be, we'd all be billionaires. Like, <laughs> so, on this, on, so, but it's okay to say here, look, we think it's reasonable that we're going to capture 10% of this market or whatever. Um, yeah, Trevor and I were just talking about this. Um, I think it's like, you want to show the opportunity size, but then you have to be able to back it up. Um, I was actually talking to Tobin in the back, and he said, well, I think my number is, is, I mean, he had, you had like 80 some million. I was like, really? Are you going to raise $500 million to go acquire those customers? Like, it's okay if you put a big number there, but you better think about truly what do you think about capturing? Um, and you, and you know, like, we know Airbnb has far surpassed that in revenue, right? And I think yeah. they had projected that by 2011, and this was like a debt put out in like 07 or 08 for them. So you know, over a four or five year period, they thought that that was a reasonable way to demonstrate it. Um, I think as you demonstrate it, be able to back up why you think that's the case. Um, or say, you know, we're so, Trevor and I were talking about, we're so early on, we think it's reasonable to capture, you know, five or 10% of the market. I'm not sure how long it's gonna take me to get there. Okay. Natasha. Um, so when the um, ABNB put this number, 200 million, did they have revenue? Did they show a projection? We are making whatever, 5 million, and we are um, growing year to year. Yeah, they were, they were very early on, um, but they had initial traction um, and were able to show financials that say, this is how we think we can get there. So, so I mean, are people looking for traction and growth trajectory that you can, then you say this is how it's going to go because this is how I'm doing today? Yeah, so um, I'm going to qualify that based on what stage you're in. You know, some, sometimes you're so, so early on. Um, to put out those those projections, you need to put together projections that show, if I put this money into my business, I think I can get here. Um, but know that they're projections, right? Um, as you become a little bit further uh, along, um, they're going to be narrowing in on your projections even more. Uh, okay, if you're three million dollars this year, is it reasonable to say you would double or triple that growth? And then is it reasonable to say the following year you would double or triple that growth? I mean, it's kind of a reasonability, and how do you plan to operate your business to get there? So you have to show some logic, um, but you have to also realize that some of it you don't know. I mean, this was some of my frustration in raising money, and like, if I could predict the future, I'd be a billionaire, right? Um, but then I realized that they're not always looking at um, what you can predict, but how is, they're looking at your methodology. Like they're thinking, of, they, they, wanna, they wanna really talk to you as an entrepreneur of, if you raise X capital, what do you think is reasonable to achieve? And do those make sense? Well, I've seen this in the financial model where someone shows they're gonna grow to $20 million in, in revenue and they're gonna have a 5% team. Like we just know that's not reasonable. You know, you're, you're your expenses are likely going to be maybe 15, 20 million when you're making 20 million. I mean, there's this like whole part of growing and scaling a company where you're spending just about as much as you are making before you kind of hit this 
tipping point and are capturing the market. That's a lot of information. I, I feel like we have to kind of go deeper one on one. Um, it's a very complicated subject to kind of give a broad overview on. Trevor, we had uh, we had meetings like early meetings with the VC with just their associates. And they actually said when we move you the formal process, we prefer if you just strip out uh, all your numbers, projected market, because they're just like, you guys are way too early and there's mm. nobody to benchmark you guys. So. That's interesting. That's interesting yeah. yeah. And you might talk to another investor and they said, well, where's your analysis of this? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's what you'll get to when you're raising money. Someone over here will say one thing, another investor will say another, another investor will say another. And as an entrepreneur, you just have to be able to defend your methodology. On the tipping point, is there, like, I know obviously every business is different, but is there, like, year three, year five is where you can expect to see that tip to happen? Or, I mean, obviously it's very dynamic based on what you're doing, but is there a kind of general rule of thumb there? Just kind of benchmark yourself? So, I would say one is very dynamic. Depends on what business you're in. Depends on what your vision for the business is. Depends on what kind of investors you have. I mean, more... Conservative investors are going to want to show profitability and break in even sooner. Um, coastal investors, they could care less about profitability. They want you to just they build as massive amount of business as possible. I mean, you think about some of the <coughs> billion dollar um, companies out on the um, coast, they're not, they're losing money. They're losing hundreds of millions of dollars in money because they're so focused on growth. Um, like in a more conservative region, taking that that approach for your business plan would not fly. You probably want to be able to raise capital. Here's my opinion. Therese, I actually had Microsoft get back with me uh, and they jumped from my idea and said as soon as I get a prototype to call it. I mean, they jumped over all these different steps. Uh -huh. Have you come across anything like that before? Um, well, they'll say get back to me, but they'll then expect a lot of work and detail behind it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's probably their way of saying you're too early on, but when you hit another milestone, give us a call. Okay. Uh, but they're likely going to go deep at that point if they're truly interested. Got it. Uh, and, you know, and I think it's the, the point some entrepreneurs are really successful in raising money on just an idea. I would say that's very, 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 very hard to do. But it does happen. All right, so we've talked about um, business model. Now going into competition. Who are you competing against? Um, what makes you better and different? Um, I would say really do your diligence on who your competitors are. It's better for you to know everyone who could be a potential competitor than an investor asking you questions about a handful of companies you haven't heard. Um, you can go online, there's a bunch of different tools to find um, competition. Um, I have to say, you're probably not the only one with an idea. Um, and so even if your idea is different, it's better to say, these are all the people that could be taking some of our market share, and this is why we're different. Um, Crunchbase, AngelList, um, those are good sources to find competitors. Mike, do you mind telling a story early on of someone once told you, like, I have no competitors. You entered in kind of yeah. their their company segment yeah. into AngelList or Crunchbase. Yeah, it's really found. common for an AngelList. I do a lot of, I do some of the best, you know, I run an Angel group. And it's really common to hear there are no competitors. And, and so first of all, there's tough kinds of competition. There's direct competition. Um, I make trucks, you make trucks. There's also you know, the substitute, it's you're buying A, B doesn't exist, whatever your cool idea is, but you're buying something else to do the same thing. So the problem I run into is many times someone says, well, there's nobody doing this, and I'll go on and search Crunchbase, Pitch Deck, um, AngelList, and I'll find a list and list of people who are doing it. So it's be really careful when you do your competition slide, because especially the more experienced investors, they have tools, very expensive tools in some cases, uh, the paid version of Crunchbase is not the same as free, but they're going to do that research. So you've got to make sure you know what's out there. And again, don't look for companies that are already launched. You've got to go into AngelList and look for the teams that are saying, I'm looking for somebody that can build this product. Because there are a lot of people just like you out there in the build process. Um, you know, it's very unlikely you're standing on your own with an idea. 
Um, I, I, just a personal story to you. Sometimes you get so deep in your business and operating it and building it that you don't always take the time to like look up and see what others are doing. Because I, you know, I used to have some of the opinion of it doesn't really matter what they're doing. I have to execute well on what I'm doing. Um, and I have so much in front of me. If I would just execute, we'd be successful. Uh, but I, you know, I learned the hard way of not taking the time prior to like kind of going into investor meetings where they were saying names of companies, and I probably looked like deer in a headlight. I hadn't heard of these companies. You know, in a simple search, you know, you can go online. And just they just raised five million dollars. They just raised two million dollars. I should have been doing my research. I should have been kind of staying up on the competition. Uh, again, but that's hard when you're so into your own business. But I would say, you know, kind of from my own lesson learned, take the time um, to be following um, what's happening in your industry, taking time before you go out and raise money to see what's going on. Um, pop your head up, you know, out of the sand and see what's all going on. Do you have a widget or something technical? Have you used anybody else's code? Have you done a patent check? Have you, what's your legal risk? That's the question I'm going to want to. From an investor standpoint, yep. Um, here's a, an example of how to build a, a competition site. Again, this was uh, an example based on air, bed and breakfast, Airbnb. Uh, and this is kind of the, the ma magic uh, quadrant where you want to be in the upper right hand side. So they are affordable and they offer online transactions. And kind of historically remembering back at the time, there weren't a lot of online marketplaces that you could book um, something online. So that's really where they were um, different than the competition. And Airbnb, they were, you know, hostels.com um, was another option, but they were saying, you know, they, they offer online, but they're not affordable. Um, Craigslist was uh, affordable, but an offline booking transaction. Uh, then they were comparing themselves to VRBO, which at the time didn't offer um, online uh, booking capability. And they were also saying, you know, VRBO is way more expensive than what we are Airbnb. Um, <coughs> Hotels.com, so they're saying, this is kind of an existing player in their marketplace. As Air Airbnb, we're cheaper than um, hotels. But hotels are also booking online. So that just kind of gives you an idea of a matrix. Um, I also want to use this as an example. I don't always like this affordable, expensive um, comparison. Um, I think it's kind of dangerous to compete on price. Um, what else are you going to be good at besides price? And it's not always the best being the cheapest. Um, in this case, Airbnb said, you know what, affordability is something that we're going to really kind of put our foot down and make a strategic, um, we're going to be strategically uh, different in that way. Uh, but again, don't just kind of say, we're cheaper. That's like our other uh, majors. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to work on competition. Are there questions around um, competition sites? When you're presenting this slide, you, you talked about maybe doing like angel list yeah, searches course. and those sorts of things. Maybe some of the smaller competitors in that space. When you're presenting this, how will those ever know? Or strategically, when you're having that conversation, uh, no. uh, like, hey, I'm sorry, it's just a little hard to hear. This is how my business compares to things that are familiar, perhaps, to the, the investor that you're talking to versus here's this sort of abstract company that also is doing this very same thing. How do you have that conversation? Um, so if someone's doing the very same thing, how, how are you going to win? I, those are things you have to think about. Um, so you, you do really have to say, like, if I was sitting pitching against this other company, this is why I think I'm better. And, it, and this, this is hard to do, you know. It really is, is forcing you to think, why is someone going to choose me versus my competitor? Is it good and, to bring those on? Sorry, is it good to bring those on the uh, competition slide, those, um, those competitors? I think as you talk about them, yes. Um, they should fit somewhere. And it might be that they're close to you. You know, you might be, you're, you're up here, and they might be close, but you might be nuanced and better. Um, sometimes it's platform offering, you know, it's, um, a lot of my clients want to go into the features. And I said, yeah, that's great, but what if someone just goes into the money? That other competitor can have just as many features as you. So when you think about even feature base, you know, why is your product better? Um, is it that you offer a full platform and someone else offers a limited platform? Uh, without knowing your business, it's kind of hard to talk about generically. Um, another thing to think about is sometimes you're competing against like established old ways. So Excel, Microsoft Word, 
um, email, Facebook. I mean, those might be your competitors that you're completely coming up with a new way to do something better than Excel. But Excel should probably be on your sheet of like a static-based solution versus a dynamic-based solution. Does that make sense? How to think about the landscape. I think kind of a two-part question. Mm -hmm. One is, um, it, it's pro I'm just, I get, I just want to confirm, it's probably powerful if your, your axes here relate to the key elements of your solution that you're, you know, it, you know so Airbnb probably talked about, they were talking about being online and being affordable, so that's what should, shows up here. You don't want to be presenting new concepts here, at, you know, as far as your basis of your competition should align with the key elements right. of your solution more when, you, when you think about your even your problem and solution slides, yeah. um, oftentimes they start to frame up yeah. how you think of competing. Right. Okay. And then has the, has the two by two jumped the shark or is it still the preferred way to uh, present it? There's multiple ways to, to do the competition um, slide. Um, from a storytelling standpoint, I found this very effective because you don't get in the weeds on, you've probably seen the feature slide, which is yeah. me and everyone else and here how my features are different. Yeah. I think that's more feature and functionality versus this is the landscape of anyone who could use my tool. These are the things that they could be using. And it's a little hard, for example, if you were competing in a, against Excel <laughs> for usage, like how do you put that on a feature and functionality? Uh, it's, it's more challenging. Yeah, yeah. And you can go deeper and do, you know, my features, like how my features are better, but I don't think that really shows competition. Okay. Trevor. Uh, what about talking about com competitors that fail? Um, that's a... What, what point would you be trying to make? Um, you know, they came into the space, they tried to do it. The reason they failed is because we're, you know, things that we've said that we're gonna do well. Um, it might work. Um, I just be careful not to get into a rabbit hole. Okay. And also then you bring into a doubt, a doubt for an investor of like, well, if they fail, and if they were a big company, if they were well funded and they couldn't figure it out, that's kind of naive, Trevor, to think you just got it all figured out. Like there's probably more nuances in it that right. might raise more doubt than like confidence. You might be able to pull it off. I'm not saying you can't, but. No, no. <laughs> I think it probably, the points you made, I'm probably saying. <laughs> On the flip side of that, like, it wouldn't be direct competition because it's not in the same market. But if there's someone doing something similar, but in, let's say, on the coast, uh -huh. um, is it a good idea to try and benchmark if they're super successful at that point? So here's a competitor, but it's not within this market, and this is what they're doing here, and the numbers that support or collaborate mm. what I'm trying to do in this market. Um, that, could, that, that could be compelling. Um, again, it's a little abstract for me to give you like yeah. exact feedback on. Um, it kind of goes twofold, right? You can, what my initial thoughts are is um, if that venue, if are they singularly focused or would they sometimes come into this market? So in some sense, it like again might bring in that doubt of like, okay, if they're that great, they might expand nationally and in five years you're not gonna have a business because you're not national. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen that with some of like the hyper local competitors to um, delivery services of, oh, that's great that you've created a local delivery service, but you know, catch up five years when all those, you know, big city companies come here, are you gonna still have a business? So it's not always a point you want to make or you should be able to like address it at that point of how, how would you compete if those kind of those the companies that you're using an example of success were to come compete with you. Trevor. Uh, going back to like crunch phase, you can see some of your competitors and the VCs that invested in them. Is going after those VCs typically a good idea? Mm. If they're direct competitors, likely not. Um, there's no magic rule, but what I often find is most VCs are investing in a lot of direct competitors to their portfolio companies. That's not always the case, um, but usually the case. They, they have to see that you're enough different and going after enough like, different market share for them to say, I'm gonna put chips into both of these companies. Um, and then from an entrepreneur standpoint, I would have to be a little leery too of how close you are and who's serving on which boards because what information sharing is happening within that firm. 
Um, and do you want them knowing kind of your next strategic move if they're invested in a somewhat competitive company? So as an entrepreneur, I think you also have to make that decision. All right, there's been a lot of wonderful questions, so please keep those coming. We're in, we're in no rush, um, no hurry. I think we're, we're a little behind schedule, but I'm not going to like try to overly compensate for it. So <laughs> I think that the interaction and the questions are actually where a lot of the value come when you think about your, your own business, what you're building, and you're able to learn from others in the room as well. So now moving on to competitive advantage. Um, this is the, the point where you start to talk about why do you win? Why are you going to win against your competitors? Why are you going to win in the space that you're at? Um, not to put you in a box, but there's kind of some best practices. Typically, you would win in one of these five categories. Your product, cost, positioning, distribution, and execution. I always, and I think not even my own wisdom, everyone's kind of wisdom out in the ethers <laughs> are pick one or two. If, if you say you're going to win in all five of these, it's just not realistic, and you then don't really have an advantage. It's kind of watered down, down amongst five categories versus saying, I'm going to be the best at this and this. And by being the best at these two things, um, I'm going to be the winner. <clears throat> so some examples of um, how you might talk about your competitive advantage in each of these areas. Uh, other product, it might be your ease of use. It might be your IP. It might be that you create some unique barrier uh, from someone switching from your company to another company. Distribution. This might be the way that uh, you're disrupting the buying chain. How people come to you versus your competitor. Cost. Uh, I think I've already shared a little bit of my opinion on cost. It's not always the place that you want to win, uh, but sometimes you're very uh, disruptive to the ecosystem and you can just drive a cost um, down like no other. Uh, you think about Walmart. Walmart is all about cost and they've really made that their um, competitive advantage is being the lowest cost. Execution. Are you the first mover? Are you, are you a uniquely qualified team? I think this one can get you in a little bit of trouble. Uh, if you are the first mover but maybe a large company can come and do the, the next thing right after you um, and they're more well funded, it doesn't really matter that you're the first mover. I, I'm sure you've often seen this, some of the first movers aren't the company that's actually successful. Um, so be careful if, if you say, I have the first mover advantage, really think through um, what, that, what that means long term and if it is actually a long term advantage. And then positioning. You might have a very unique brand, um, a very clear value proposition that as a, as a company puts you in a unique spot. I'm going to give you a few minutes to work on what is your competitive advantage, and I'll be taking questions as you guys are working on that. Would you mind elaborating a little more if you have an example or something on positioning? Yes. Um, Good, bad, and otherwise, one of the companies that comes to mind first is Zappos. So lots of people sh sell shoes, but the way that they put together their branding around customer support and um, who they are as a company really kind of makes them stick out from any other shoe company, um, as one example. Um, does anyone else have a brand example? Mike, do you have a, another brand example? The one I said was Zappos that was... Um, very uniquely positioned of lots of people selling shoes, but Zappos did it in a positioning way really unique. What's what's another example you may have? Um, I think Tesla. Tesla. Right Tesla. Now, there's a lot of electric cars out there, yeah. a lot of good ones. And Tesla, for all the challenges and the craziness of their CEO, people are lining up still to buy their car. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Um, do you think you're going to build it out organically? Are you building very specific, high-value partnerships that are going to help distribute your, your product? Um, and then what initial validation do you have um, that your plan will work? And early on, your, your long-term plan versus your immediate plan might be different. And an example of that is long-term, you might plan on having channel partners. Uh, but initially, maybe the first two years, you need to sell direct um, in order to build credibility, in order to test your product, in order to get it out there. And so just depending on how much clarity you have on vision um, would be the level of detail that you'd go in here. Um, sometimes I see people say, you know, the next 18 months, this is what we're going to um, execute on. Uh, be prepared to talk beyond 18 months, uh, but I think it's just fine to say this is what we plan on doing the next 18 months. Um, I think if you have channel partnerships in there super early and you haven't yet proven out um, even the product in the market, you might get some questions and some pushback from investors. Um, they might also say, you know, do you want to put that much um, in, in kind of invested in channel partners that you can't move the needle as fast as um, selling direct? So that's kind of the shift, like phase one, phase two, phase three. How do you think you're going to sell your, your product over the, the next several years? Um, and then if you have any traction, if you, sh you have anything that shows, hey, I've demonstrated that I can sell direct, um, show kind of what that traction looks like. If you have been able to establish some distribution partnerships, start to list what those distribution partnerships are um, as kind of proof points of this theory, um, I've been able to prove out that in, in some sense, I've gotten early traction around it. I have a question on some of that. So if you've talked to audience, whatever it is you're trying to sell through, and you've gotten some great validation, some great feedback, but it's inconsistent, meaning I don't have like a set of standardized questions, is it awkward to go back and say, I know we already talked about all this stuff, but what is your favorite color? <laughs> all this kind of crap, but then when it gets to time, now I've got quantifiable data that I can say, of the 20 people that I've talked to, nine are doing this, three are doing that, five, and it's not just so much to, a note-taking session on my part. That um, again, it's somewhat hard to respond abstractly, sure. but I'll attempt. Um, I think there's a difference between interest and actual sales. And so an investor will probably push you on that of, that's great, you did a survey, or you've talked to 20 people and they're all interested, show me the money. Right. You know, at some point, um, can you show pilots like there are are that they're using the product for free? Right. That might free is not always awesome, right? Sure. Um, but are you able to show someone using your product? Sure. Usage dollars um, are usually what they're looking for. Of like, hey, there's initial proof point. Or if you're trying to say, um, I'm gonna all of my customers are gonna come organically via online marketing. Well, you better have been able to show. I spent a little bit on Google AdWords or this or that, and this is the organic traffic that I was able to attract. Um, versus saying, yeah, I'm going to do this all organically, but you have nothing to show that people will actually search you out and find you organically. Okay. Any other questions when it, talk, when it comes to um, your go-to-market slash marketing plan? Um, it doesn't have to be super detailed either. Um, if someone's going to invest in you, they're going to go deep on, okay, talk to me more about your marketing plan. Are you going to trade shows? Are you doing this? What's your budget? How much do you spend on spending on online advertising? Um, that will come later. This is more just high level. Um, how, do you, how do you plan on attracting customers? Team, um, highlight any special talents or experience that make your team um, well suited um, to do what you're doing. Your, this might be your key founding team, or if, if you, I would say, super early on, you probably don't have like a whole VP team, and if you inflate people's titles, um, please don't do that. It looks really goofy if you have someone who's, you know, a coder who you call your CTO, um, but he has no CTO experience. I mean, think about those titles. I think early on, you want to slap like all these titles on, um, but you should be able to defend Yes, they are CTO. They do have strategy and vision beyond just execution, if you call them your CTO. Um, it's okay to have some holes in your team. Um, everyone knows that you're early on, and this is not the team that you're going to have in 12 months, 18 months. That's kind of why you're raising capital. Is usually a lot of it goes into investing in your team. Um, but hopefully that early team shows that you're, you know, 
qualified to take this to the next level, qualified to figure out how to build out that team, um, to take the capital you're raising and uh, move the company to the next milestone. Uh, this would also be if you have a board, if you have a board of advisors, um, you can either put them on this slide or do two slides on your team. Question. As far as the CEO, COO, CTO whole piece, we initially stayed away from that just because we want to be, you know, uh, realistic as to who's on our team. We have good people, but maybe they don't fill that role. And then we had, as we were talking to some of the VCs, they were asking us, well, who's your COO? Who's this? said, well, you know, this person handles the operations, but they're not the CEO, and that caused them to then kind of question more why they weren't that person. Mm. What What's a good way to kind of deal with that where we want to be understanding that we would like to hire a, you know, professional at that, uh -huh. and we have someone who's who's filling in at that role now, but not that we're just unprepared for it or we're just kind of right. throwing people anywhere. I think it's how you talk about it, right? And you tell the story. And um, some investors might be pushing you just to see if you have clarity around it. Is it no one has clear roles and responsibilities and no one wants to have titles because there's not um, clear separation of you know, who's actually responsible for things? Is it, hey, I have a great team who I think is going to take me to the next 18 months, but I don't think that person's going to be the COO long term. Therefore, it would be ridiculous to call them the COO right now. Like they might be a VP of operations because long term you plan on hiring a professional COO. Mm -hmm. um, or you might only need a um, controller but not a CFO right now. So it's again how you have the vision. It's like what are your intentions? And they might not be saying pushing you because they expect one thing or the other. They, they're di diving deeper on what's your vision around your team. Does that match kind of your yeah, experience? Helps. Yeah. Um, other questions about team? Trevor. We are, one of our big gaps on our team is uh, like the actual sales side, sales and marketing. Uh -huh. um, but we've been like kind of hiring for the role, so interviewing for it. Um, and we have a person that we think is going to be the person, but you know we we've known this person for a while. We've had a lot of discussions with them, and we both think it's better to bring them on after we finish like raising the, the money needed uh -huh. because we wouldn't be able to afford them otherwise. Right. Right. Um, so. Um, they said they're comfortable with us talking about them and they're willing to you know, talk to investors and say, yes, they're going to take this role, but uh -huh. do you think it's like, you might want to stay away from that? Yeah, uh, I would leave thoughts? them off the slide until they're full time, because A, a lot can change. Even if they're super committed, um, they might not, if it's two months, six months, 12 months before you get the fundraise done, right. like their life might change as well. So there's kind of a danger of putting someone on there that's not on the team. Um, I think it also over-represents where you're at. They're not actually on the team. But I think it's okay to say, once we close this round, our intention is to bring this person on. We have someone identified. They're really excited. I think that's okay. Because it shows the vision for um, a gap you have and how you plan to fill it. Um, but that plan might change because yeah. everything changes in time. Okay. okay. Other questions around team? Jen. So for advisory board, I mean, is there like a formula of who you think is the best for on your advisory board? Um, I don't think there's an exact formula. Um, I think it should fill gaps that you have. And sometimes, um, through my own experience, some of the advisors we had were positions we weren't yet in a position to need full time. Like we didn't need a CFO super early on, but they were on our board, board or an advisory board because we knew we wanted some of the expertise, but it didn't make sense in a full time role. Um, you might think about what are the gaps that you have. Is it in HR? Is it in selling? If it is it in real estate? <coughs> Whatever gaps you might have, and is it realistic that an advisor um, can add value? Uh, you kind of lead into my next question, or you know, my next slide. Advisory boards aren't expected, but sometimes can be very helpful early on. Um, some things to keep in mind: if you have an advisory board, you really need to be keeping them up to date. Um, and utilizing them and not just putting their pictures and names on a slide because most most savvy investors will call your advisory board and say hey I want to get your thoughts on this this and this and if your advisory board isn't really clued in it's not actually adding a lot of benefit um, for them to be part of of your team um, also kind of managing the time and like how much time are you spending getting your advisory board up to speed versus what are they able to cont contribute um, I've seen some people build out these elaborate advisory boards, but then they don't actually really utilize them, but they put a lot of time into meeting with you know, advisors and getting them on the team, 
but then it just became one more thing for them to manage unsuccessfully. Um, be clear on what what you want from them um, when you're meeting with advisors. Is it like a weekly call? Is it a monthly check-in? Is it they're going to be part of a, a you know kind of a board meeting? Um, it, that those all things help you be more successful. Um, and don't overplay in your your pitch. Um, an investor knows like an advisor is not a full-time role. They can you know they're often not paid. So the impact to your company um, shouldn't be shouldn't be overplayed. Uh, other questions around building out your team slides. All right. Um, now moving on to traction. So highlighting what you've been able to accomplish to date. And as we talked earlier, you know, traction can look at, like different things at different stages. At stages, it might be product traction, it might be customer traction, it might be sales traction, um, and it might be kind of user user traction sometimes early on you might not have a lot of revenue traction but you've been able to show that people are consistently using your your platform um, if you're able to chart it out if it's data uh, you know charting out traction in a visual way is really helpful if it's milestones as far as execution you might um, build a timeline that shows these are all the things that we've accomplished that shows kind of execution traction there's different ways um, to visualize it uh, Try to make it interactive and just like some bullet points of these are the things we've done. Question around traction. Hmm. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, you're going along and then you change your personnel or like you said, sometimes you have to change your team and your growth pattern or your traction pattern takes a major dip. Mm -hmm. How do you counter that? How do you address that? Because I know in business it's just like you said, Raising money is like this, so uh -huh. business. Business never really follows that clear of a trajectory. <coughs> At least my experience has not been that. How do you? How have you seen that addressed in slide deck? Mm -hmm. When, especially if you're an older business, like not a startup, but you're also going to raise capital to take it to the next route. Makes sense. Um, there's a couple things. One, I would say it's how you visualize the data. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes an investor doesn't need to know super, super granular things, right? Mm -hmm. What might seem like it rocks your world and like a outside viewpoint <coughs> wasn't a big deal. So if you're showing, it might have affected your monthly data, but if you were to like pull it out, like what did your yearly data look like? What did your quarterly data look like? Um, that's something I've done with my customers where they were so close to it, they felt like, it, oh my gosh, I have this like big red flag that I'm gonna have to explain. Investors know you have up and downs, and if you pull out one like by quarter, all of a sudden the data looked pretty consistent. But it just felt so emotional for that entrepreneur. So one, think about the data. Like, is it as big a deal as it feels like for you? Uh, and if it is, if you have ups and downs, like if you pull out the data, you know, by quarter or by year, and it looks like a big down, just be able to explain what happened. Um, again, investors are used to things; they don't always. It's almost like a red flag if it looks too, too perfect, right? Like, do, 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 like everything was just perfect. Um, most investors know that that's not the case. We have ups and downs. There might be seasonality. Uh, that might be another thing. Um, the data might look worse than what it is, and you're able to say, we know seasonality happens here and here. If it's that obvious, you can, you know, actually put that on your traction slide. Um, you know, explain what the ups and downs are ahead of time. Um, I actually this past week I was looking at someone's deck and their most recent quarter looked awful. I was like, what happened? And they're like, well, that's only a month and a half of data. And I said, well, <laughs> you need to better articulate that because as an investor, my first reaction was, you're having a horrible quarter. Uh, but they hadn't finished out February and they hadn't even started put March quarters in there. So just be really careful of how you how you put the data in there. Um, any other questions on traction? Do do all of you kind of just kind of yes, no, know how you show traction in your business? Or are you still trying to figure out how you would demonstrate that? Absolutely trying to kind of the wobble. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, yes. I was still trying to figure that out yet, but I'm super really in, in the process of either. Do you have customers yet, or is it still in product phase? It's still product phase, yeah. Product phase. Even all the research of is this even idea that people are interested in. Yes, yeah. No, yeah. It is. Great. Cool. I'm going to start building one for free. Try it out. Let me know. Uh -huh. 
I think those are the things, you know, that what are the activities you've done to start to prove out, to show that there's less risk to an investor. Those are the things that you, you've accomplished. All right, now to the fundraising slide. Um, this is where you say um, how much you're raising. Um, what round is it? Is it angels, is it seed, is it series A? Um, what do you want to achieve in X amount of time? So if you're raising $2 million, what are the set of milestones that you're hoping to achieve um, in that next uh, amount of time? Uh, and I found like a simple timeline can be used to show hey, we're bringing this money in and these are the, the benchmarks that we want to achieve over time. Um, you might be, it kind of goes into, um, uh, I don't have it in here, sorry. So sometimes together I would see a fundraising slide and then a use of funds slide. And on the use of funds slide, uh, you would say, you know, I want to spend X on uh, marketing or I want to invest 500K in these key hires or I want to spend 500K on these product iterations. Um, usually it falls into some of those categories. What are you going to spend on people? What are you going to spend on product? What are you going to spend, spend on sales and marketing? And this can be very boiled up. Um, remember, this is kind of the first time they're meeting you. You're not diving deep into the financials, but you should roughly know, you know, people, product, sales, marketing, where you're going to spend the money. Um, there was a couple questions that Bernie asked me uh, kind of over the break is um, kind of what's your strategy as far as what you put out there as far as what the asks are. And there's a different approach to this. Um, one, does it matter kind of what you're raising? Is it a seed round? Is it a friends and family? Is it an angel? I would say don't get so caught up in the vernacular. Um, if you're not building a successful company, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but one word, uh, kind of like a little wisdom that I learned over the years, at Dwell, I think we did this, I would say in my opinion, we did this kind of naively. We raised um, an angel round, or a, an A round that was a million dollars. Then as we went to raise our B round, which was five million dollars, most coastal investors would see five million dollars be the A round. And so then when we raised our C round, Everyone expected us to be kind of much further, but really it was only our B round. So this is where it does matter of, it's okay to have an angel round or a C round multiple times before you get to that A stage. Um, just be thoughtful about that, but don't spend too much time, you know, over engineering it. I've seen like complicated A, A, A1 round, A2 round, and then that gets confusing as well. Uh, but do give it some thought as you're starting on this journey, kind of, what those phases look like. It, would you mind explaining to your perspective briefly about the difference between seed and angel? Like I've seen companies that are revenue generating, <coughs> raising, announcing a seed round. I, you know, I think of seed as planting a seed, it hasn't grown. So I, I don't know, I, I, do you have any, what, what, how do people normally, what, what's the difference between angel and seed to most people? I don't know if I can give you a good answer because one, for one example, I could say here's a seed round, and then another one they're calling it an angel round. Um, that's where I, I don't, I'm not always sure that the vernacular works. Um, I would pay attention to the investors you're raising from. What language do they use? And that sometimes might set the tone of they do seed round. Like in all the announcements that they invested in, it was seed, seed, seed. Um, another investor might, you know, they call it an angel round, and everything they've done is like, we invested in this angel round. Um, I think different funds do it differently. Um, if you're pulling together groups, which we'll get into strategy more. I, I might table this for sure. when we get into the strategy. But there's, not a, there's not a hard and fast rule okay. in my, my experience. Um, I think another question is, how much are you raising? Uh, have a clear view on how much you're raising, knowing um, that you might have some upside on there. If you're getting a lot of traction and you would know what to do with more money, you might end up raising more. Uh, I think there's also this perception of, are you successful in your fundraising? So if you set out to raise a million dollars, but you're only able to get to 750, you can, in kind of investor's eyes, look like you failed at raising the full amount. So think through, hey, if I hit 750, would I, could I put that money to good use? And do I say I'm raising 750 and oversubscribing another 250? You're, do, you, do you sense the optics there? Like if, if investors kind of want to jump on success. So I was successfully able to raise 750, you know, because of all the interest, I'm going to raise another 250 to get me to a million. Versus 
man, I really want to raise a million dollars and I'm having a tough time getting there. You know, what do you think is going to be more compelling to those investors to say, oh, they're having success? So that, that might influence the amount you state that you're going to raise. Uh, I see a lot of times people setting a minimum and saying that they might oversubscribe to that, but they are very clear on what they know they're going to do with that minimum amount. Typically you would raise for 15 to 18 months of runway um, and knowing kind of that, what milestones you would achieve. Um, early on, uh, Trevor, to your question, like if I only need 100K to get to X, you might raise less and for a smaller amount of time, that first kind of seed round or that friends and family, because um, you have a lot to prove out with a small amount versus going and saying, I really need a million and a half to get 18 months down the, the road. You might have to show some initial traction with a smaller raise first. Uh, and then I would say, raise the amount that allows you to get back to building your business. Um, sometimes raising more um, can totally take your focus away from the business because it's just taking so long for you to raise it that your traction starts to go down. So what's kind of that sweet spot for you um, that allows you to get it done and back to work? This in itself, I think, could be a two-hour um, workshop. Um, what's my company worth? So I'm going to give a very, very high level, um, probably oversimplifying it. You know that going in. Um, so the truth that I've seen, this again, my opinion, is the valuations are often determined on how much the investor wants to own of your company. And there's some, you know, pretty standard mathematics behind. Um, VC firms, how much that they they want to own if they're going to put time and money in your company. This is typically, you know, in the 20 to 25 percent range. Um, so the the math is uh, pretty standard. Of okay, so what does that make your company worth? Um, there's different ways around this. Sometimes early on, you're not in a position to really put a logical valuation on your company. Uh, that's why sometimes people raise. Um, debt rather than um, equity um, at the very early because they don't they don't yet want a valuation on their company and they don't think they're going to achieve enough in 12 months to make that valuation an exponential growth. Um, later on in your company's life cycle, there's more sophisticated tools I think to set valuation. You know what is. Um, what is your IP worth? What is your revenue show times a multiple that's um, normal for your industry? Uh, early on when you're pre-revenue or just so it's such small revenue, it's virtually impossible to use those kind of more standardized methodologies um, to determine valuation. Does anyone have questions on this? Well, I would Mike, you're smiling. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> it's hard. Early, early, early stage, it's, it's how much you know, it's valued based on what someone will, rate, will let you raise. I mean, I, as an investor, I'm not going to come in if I'm discreet valuation. So, it's a negotiation. This is, um, I think it also relates back to a question, or Bernie and I were having a conversation of you don't want to go to investors with, like, with completely no idea, but I think you don't want to go in hard and fast on a number either until you've somewhat evaluated, uh, validated it with investors. Some strategies, if you're able to do a competitive fundraise, you would not set a valuation. You would let the investor set the valuation. They would give you a term sheet that says, I'm willing to invest X at Y dollars. And, you know, professionally, they're used to doing that. They see a lot of deals. Um, that is standard for them. In non-coastal markets, sometimes it's very hard to fundraise in that manner, and you need to lead the way as the company by setting the valuation, by setting the amount you're going to raise. Um, again, I would validate that though with who are some investors that are interested? You know, say I'm thinking about this valuation. Is that something that's palatable to your organization, to you as an individual? Get some feedback before you kind of overshoot and get lots of no's. Because it's hard to go back. Um, people, you might not think that people share information, but if they're investing in you, they're likely talking to other investors. And if you're all over the board, yeah, that guy said his valuation's $5 million. Oh, I met with him last week and he said it's $2 million. I mean, you just want to be careful of those conversations. Sorry, was there a question? Oh, I have a lot of questions around oh. this one, but I'm trying to temper them. So, well, I guess the difference for me is that I'm, I'm a 25-year-old company trying to go to the next round. So I have a history and I have a valuation, but I've also hit a rocky road <coughs> trying to build in the next level of management. 
And so I'm trying to figure out, but, but one of the things that uh, the most, having put, having have 100% ownership, one of the scariest things is giving up ownership. Because now I'm giving somebody else authority within the mm -hmm. decisions. And so when I, I mean, I'm not afraid of 20, 25% ownership. What I'm curious about is how you, how you, as you build rounds, as let's say I go after five different funders, how do you start to spread that out? Because you can't, five funders at 20% is 100% of the company. Now you're, that's just never made oh. sense to me. And how do you learn that? When I, I mean, say 20%, it would be for that entire angel round. So you might, if you get wealthy individuals, you might get five wealthy individuals to each write you 100K. So that's 500K. Mm -hmm. That 500K total is that round would be that 20 to 25%, not each individual investor. So that's one point of clarity. So they don't have 20% ownership in the company, they have 20% of that round. That's so each individual, I, I, I like Mike, is Mike, Mike was, individual has 4%. Yeah. Right, I, you, I could have 2%, this guy could have 5 he could have. Seven. And they might the whole totality. And the over -totality. It's but that that kind of that fundraising event, which would be considered one event with multiple people, and twenty percent. Okay. So it all adds up to that. Um, but yeah, you have to. And this is also where you have to think about the strategy and the fundamentals. Does it make sense? How is that person going to get their money back? Right? What's the exit? What's the return? Well, in in technology companies, you often don't do dividends. Um, through my experience, it's more people waiting for the end event. Um, but if your company is valued at five million and they want ten x on that, you have to have a trajectory of like how are how are you going to grow that company ten x? And that impacts the type of investors you seek out. You know, versus someone saying, I'll put in twenty thousand and I. Hopefully, in a few years, we we'll get forty thousand back. It's a very different type of investor that has a different expectation on how you grow the company. Um, I think this this chart I really like to show just the different regions have different ways that they approach um, valuations and um, the amount vested. The the math still really kind of works at this twenty percent, but it, what it impacts is the amount that they're raising. So in in the valley. You might see an angel or seed round, they, they're raising um, quite a bit of money uh, versus, you know, in typic, in Iowa, kind of that initial seed um, round is around 500K. So you'll just see uh, people are taking different risks. Um, they have just different um, approaches to raising money and being thoughtful of where, where you're raising from and what kind of expectation do they have. If you go to a, C, a Silicon Valley company and say you're going to raise 500k, unless they have that in the DNA of their firm to make that small investment, you might not be successful unless you do a larger round because of that audience and because of the way that they invest. If you're trying to low, um, raise outside of the two coasts, raising four and a half million on your seed is probably going to be a really hard endeavor um, because non-coastal areas just don't see that larger grounds and the expectations around those companies. Um, Trevor. Uh, is this an average or a median or just like 75th quartile? Like what? I, I think it was the average of, okay. of them. So half of them raise over and half of them raise under? Are they all, uh, sorry, you're now asking a mathematical question. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, I'll say uh, I can look at the source and see what the exact data. I can't remember. Okay, um, so it's, like it's just like like average. It's just more to point out the difference. So it could be so it could be a hundred. Add one to them, one massive one, and your stats. I know, I know. You're you're now getting into stats, which I'm not going to go there. It's more. Yeah. This, these are generally the sizes of the rounds. Yeah. In general. Yeah. Right. Is that median? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's more the medium it. <laughs> Other questions? All right. Um, the next stage in your handout, um, Jake, this goes to answer a little bit of your question. Yeah, unfortunately, um, this, all of you, the handout is turned sideways. So it's not okay. So we are having new ones printed, but we'll hear about something else. Okay. We are going to be bringing new handouts. Um, I think the overview, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but. Again, this is generally, if you're in this stage, uh, what are investors typically expecting seeing in these stages? And I, I'm going to say this is a generalization, 
of some of the expectations. Um, there's always someone that's like able to raise with none of these things accomplished, and there's other people that they have all these things accomplished and they have the hardest time raising. So um, it more serves as um, a direction of like generally what are the expectations that you can expect when you get from seed, angel, uh, series A, series B. I did have this, key milestones, use of funds. Um, we talked about this briefly, but this is um, a representation of how you could use, um, demonstrate the use of your funds. You're gonna raise X, and these are all the things you're gonna accomplish. Does so anyone have questions on how to demonstrate your, your, what you're gonna achieve with the funds that you take on? I would say on this one, be careful not to like, over promise and um, under deliver and that's often easy to do when you have no idea how long it's going to take something take you to accomplish something but investors remember what you say so be be very thoughtful in what you put out there like with this money I'm going to accomplish this because where it can bite you in the butt if you're over um, aggressive in all the things you're going to do and then 12 months later you're talking to investors and they're like they they have whole like analysts that are like in charge of remembering all this information, tracking this information, and they'll pull up your file when you go to a meet with them and say, oh, they said they were gonna do this, this, and this, and you sit down with them and you haven't done half of that. It's gonna raise questions rather than like build the excitement. So probably less is more um, in this general pitch when you're just getting to know someone. Jay. Yeah, are, can you talk about this point about the team growth? Um, and are there, I, I feel like the people I've, I've spoken with, that there are certain things that they're more interested in funding and, and certain things they're less interested in funding. And uh, is, that, is that, I mean, everyone's different, but are there kind of hot spots mm -hmm. to think about? I would say it's somewhat um, determines on the stage of like what they expect for you to achieve in that, in that stage of company that you're in. Um, I'll just kind of give some high-level thoughts. You know, is your product um, to the point where you can start to have revenue, right? And do you have to over-invest in your product to kind of get far enough ahead that someone could come along and like create the same thing? So that might be how much you want to invest in product versus, oh my gosh, you spent all this money on product and you haven't shown any sales or any customer traction. I think that's where an investor would call into question how much you're putting into that. Um, are you scaling up the team, acting like you're a uh, fully functioning business when really you don't need all of those functions yet? Uh, that's my might be where they call into question, do you need a full-time marketer? Do you need a full-time accountant? Do you need a C CFO? Are you scaling up too big of a team and you're not actually ready for that stage yet? Um, versus, okay, so you just put all this money into this area, but I don't see any sales and marketing budget. How do you expect to, like, make money? Uh, should you be putting more into that area? Um, are you over investing in sales and you yet don't have a product to sell? Like you just need to get out there and do sales even though you might not like it. I mean, those are the things I think an investor strategically thinks through and would push you on. So it's really about the stage and where you are, what your priorities are, and are your use of funds aligned to support those? Or what yes. And I would say from an entrepreneur, you want to think about Getting enough traction, the reality is most businesses that go through VC funding will take on multiple stages of funding, multiple rounds. This is like probably is likely not your only round. So what are you gonna do to, the, to be attractive for the next round? What do you have to achieve? And where do you wanna invest the money to like get that next round done? You have to accomplish something that's exciting enough to go raise again. Perfect time. Um, so you're talking about earlier how you know the last thing you want to do is be okay. I'm ready to raise my round and not um, have any relationship with investors. So when you're building those relationships, and it might be three, six, twelve months before you're actually interested in raising money, you a lot can change in a startup. Yep. So. Uh, do you just still need to be wary about, I think we could be a business Q1 2020, and then when you get to the show, you're like, Q3 2022? Uh-huh. Um, I think it's a really good point. Um, 
this is where uh, it's a challenge, right? You need to be out building relationships, but you have to be very careful on what you communicate. Um, and so it, it's where being very mindful of the entrepreneur of what's coming out of your mouth is important. <coughs> because people will remember, um, and, but yet they understand. Companies take twists and turns, um, but being able to then defend the journey that took you on the twists and turns. Okay. Does that make sense? Like, and be careful with your storyline. If you, one day you're X product, and the next day you're Y, and the next day we're doing this, and the next day we're doing this, and the next, I think that's kind of a dangerous time to be talking to investors because you're not able to be succinct in kind of what you're doing, even though like the how and the journey to get there might change. Um, and less is more. If you can boil the conversation up, uh, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing market research, validating my partnerships. And don't say a lot more. It probably will serve you better than having puking of the mouth and saying too much and then not having half that be accomplished. Right. So think about it as a conversation that you happen. I mean, if you want it to be transactional, you could just be like, look, this is it. Uh, you know, I don't want to have a relationship with you other than you believing my business. And I mean, I'm totally honest. It depends on what you want. But if you want to have that conversation over time to build that trust with the example of like, you know, in, in six or eight quarters, we're going to, this is when I'm going to be ready. Yeah, start talking to them now and build that, build that relationship so that when it does come time, they know you, they know that you mean what you say or there's more of a, an interest versus just the, the money. I think that's a great point. Investors are looking to add value. As much as you're selling them, they're also trying to sell why, why me, right? So they want to add value along the way. So if there's things that they can help you with, like let them help you, right? Don't be so I got it all together and I'm not gonna share some things that are struggle. If there's things that they can help you with, they want you, right? Because if you're such a hot company and you're doing really well, they want you to choose them versus someone else. And that's where the relationship, thank you for making that point, that's where the relationship is really key. It's a two-way street. Um, okay, we're kind of coming to an end of wrapping up the, the pitch deck portion. Um, if you have press and user testimonials, these are really, really helpful. If you have a key customer you've been piloting and they can um, share a testimonial or share um, something for you to put in your pitch deck, it's really helpful to um, show validation. Again, anything you put in here, make sure that the person um, knows that you're including them in the pitch deck or you don't have some confidentiality around the relationship. All uh, important things. And then plan on getting through the presentation in, in less than 20 minutes. Um, I've seen decks done really, really well where you can get done in 10 minutes and then you leave the rest of the time to conversation, deep diving, um, reading the investor or where they're interested, getting, not, getting time to, to know them. Um, and if you can kind of pull off the art of it feeling more like a conversation than you know, just a standard pitch. Uh, I think that you as the entrepreneur start to feel the magic too when it feels direction, you know, both ways, then you just kind of sitting up there and having no idea where the investors heads at, thoughts are, what their feedback are. Um, I think this, this top bullet point, um, start to do research of like, what are investors benchmarking you against? Um, these are a lot of times where the questions are gonna come in um, are there key measurements that they're expecting of your type of business? Uh, are there terminology? You know, uh, you might not even know what MRR, ARR, CAC, LTV, run rate, cash burn are today. Um, and for some businesses, you'll need to know those, and for other businesses, you won't. Um, I'm not going to get into all of these, but if you don't know what those are, I would say spend some time figuring those out because they might apply to what an investor will ask you um, around key metrics of your business. Um, I hate to admit, but a couple of those, um, we moved our business from a consumer facing business to a SaaS based company and I was new within the SaaS based company um, framework and I didn't know that there was kind of standards by which investors <coughs> judge companies by. Uh, it was really embarrassing to kind of learn that the first time where an investor's like, what's this number? You know, um, and I was like, I don't know what you're actually saying. Of course, that was not my response. Um, I think I politically said, our numbers are changing. Um, let me, I would rather give you the right data. I'll get back to you in a, you know, the next 24 hours um, once I've had a chance to look at that data. I mean, there's ways to recover um, from that, but 
um, you'd rather not, you'd rather just be able to give them the data that they're expecting of, of a business of your type. You know, manuf manufacturing has certain ways that they're judged by. Uh, Consumer-based businesses have other kind of metrics that are um, standard used um, to judge companies by. You might be wondering, like, how do I figure out what an investor judgment is to me by? Read their blogs. Um, what are they writing about? What are they, typically the things that they're educating you about via their blog are things that they ask um, entrepreneurs when they sit down with you. Know your customers. Be able to give clear use cases. Uh, know your competitors. And then there's, in, uh, in this workbook, there's an example of 30 questions investors are likely to ask uh, entrepreneurs. Um, read through those. How many of those do you know the answers to? Uh, those are some things that can help prepare you um, to meet with investors. The other thing is meet with people that might not be your investor, but are willing to ask you really tough questions so that <coughs> you're kind of learning how to respond, um, practice a little bit based on someone that's not like number one um, key investor that you're hoping to get. Like start with some of the other ones first um, before you kind of sit down in front of that person you really want to date and get married to. All right, I'm gonna say 